Second species counterpoint occurs when one of the two melodies is written in double time compared to the other, meaning that one of the melody's notes will span the length of two notes on the other melody. So here's an example of this. We'll call this our fixed melody, the bass, this one here. We'll call this our counterpoint. You'll notice how the counterpoint melody spans one of the notes, the length of two notes on the fixed melody. Now, the whole phrase here is not actually just second species counterpoint. This section is first species counterpoint in that the counterpoint melody and the fixed melody have exactly the same note length and play at exactly the same time. However, here we have second species, here we have second species, here we have second species, and here we have second species. Now I should actually mention, even though I don't want you to think about this too much, that fifth species counterpoint is technically a combination of multiple species within one melody phrase. So this could also be thought of as a fifth species counterpoint melody. But what I want you to focus on is just the second species here, 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 and here. That means that we have a note here spanning the length of a beat, and on the other melody, two notes, each spanning the length of half a beat. Let's have a listen to how this sounds. And you see how this can add quite a lot more interest compared to purely a first species counterpoint composition, because now we've not only got variation in pitch and intervals, but we've also got difference in species. Some of the notes last longer than others, and therefore it creates a bit more interest throughout the musical phrase. Let's listen to it with the drums employed. Just like there were some guidelines for first species counterpoint, there are some guidelines I'd like to point out for second species counterpoint. Firstly, both consonant and dissonant intervals are permitted to be used, but try to use dissonant intervals only on the off beats or as passing tones. So what this means would be here we could have a consonant interval, which this is, it's a unison, and we can employ a dissonant interval on the fixed melody here, like this. So it would be on the offbeat. The offbeat actually is in between the beats themselves. So even this is an offbeat. However, the rules I mentioned in here are relate only to second species counterpoint, whereas this is first species counterpoint. So we're going to look at only this section. So we're going from a consonant to a dissonant interval. Then this goes at the moment back to a dissonant interval. So we're going from a consonant interval here, which is the unison, it's actually the octave, to a dissonant interval. Now, this is going back to a dissonant interval on the actual beat. And the rule that I just mentioned says, try to use dissonant intervals only on the off beats. Like I said in the previous video, take these only as guidelines. Don't use them as rules. Music is very creative and subjective process. So to my ears, having this as a dissonant interval sounds good, and therefore that's what I'm going to do. Then we have, again, the same dissonant interval, and then we go into first species counterpoint. Like this, this is what it would sound like. Once more. Did you hear the bass line become a little bit dissonant, create a bit of tension for a moment, and then it resolved back to the A? Okay. The next guideline would be that when you're entering into a perfect consonance, use oblique or contrary motion. Meaning that 
if we're going to go, let's say, from a dissonant interval here into a consonant interval, we should try and use oblique or contrary motion. So this here is contrary motion. And we could make this a consonant interval by perhaps moving the C down to a B and moving the A here up to a B. So this would then become a unison or an octave. And we're doing it by moving in contrary positions, in opposite positions, therefore contrary motion. Let's have a listen. There you go. I wouldn't say that's the best choice of interval at that point in the track, but that is what the rule is implying, that if you are going to go from a dissonant to a consonant interval, use oblique or contrary motion. The next guideline, maintain melodic intervals. This means that try to stick within the confines of the scale you have chosen. Now, it's easy for me to do this because I've used that trick where I've got a MIDI file that's showing me only the notes within the key of my track and I folded, which means I cannot see any of the other notes. Let me show you what that looks like quickly as a reminder. Here, I've got all of the notes which exist in the A minor, A natural minor scale. You can see them here. And when you fold, it takes out of you all of the notes which aren't in the A natural minor scale. And then I set the start to be here, right there, so that they're actually out of the part that this MIDI clip will play. The next guideline would be that you can introduce a rest where the counterpoint won't play a note at the very beginning of the musical phrase. So what this actually means, back to here, is that we could, on either the fixed melody or the counterpoint really, introduce a rest like this. So at the very beginning, the counterpoint won't begin playing with the fixed melody, but it will either on the offbeat or on the following beat. That would sound like this. I'll replicate it here. Again, adding more interest. Couple more final tips. These are similar to the first species counterpoint as well. Avoid consecutive fifths, unisons, or octaves. Again, this is subjective, but it can sound a little bit cheesy if you've got consecutive consonant intervals, because you're not building any tension at that point, which makes the listener want you to take the music back home, back to the consonant intervals and resolve. Okay, that's it for second species counterpoint. Go and give it a try yourself. Maybe try a mixture of first species and second species counterpoint and see what you can come up with. Remember to try to stick to the confines of your scale and remember what note is the root note of your scale so that you can resolve back to it at the very beginning and potentially at the end of your musical phrase to reinforce the fact that you're performing in that scale.